title of the sermon is, What Moves the Master's Hand? What Moves the Hand of God? And I want to look at this centurion, this Roman legion officer, this centurion named Cornelius. There was a certain man in Caesarea called Cornelius, a centurion of what was called the Italian Regiment. This is a special, special troop. You know, on, on a few, couple of weeks ago, we saw the Praetorian Guard guarding the tomb of Jesus, 16 warriors, special troops. I mean, they're like the Green Beret. They're like the, the Airborne Rangers. They're like the Navy SEALs. I mean, these were the special troops. Well, this Italian regiment are specially trained, seasoned, tuned troops. This is a special group. And you don't get to be in charge of that group unless you're a special person. This is a special individual, Cornelius. And he was extra special because he was a believer and because he was a prayer warrior. He was not only a warrior for Rome, he was a warrior for heaven. Now I believe that God calls us to our own specific missions. And he calls some of us to be computer geeks. You know, and that's, a, that's a, a person, a man or a woman, who knows how to fix anything in a computer. I mean, they can even build a computer. And some people call them geeks, some people call them nerds. I don't know what else you call them, but anyway, it's kind of a badge of honor it, 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 for a lot of these kind of individuals. Now, I, I'm, I'm happy to tell you, I, actually, I'm unhappy to tell you that I'm not a computer geek. I wish I was, because I, I just am not. But... Uh, so you may be called to that. You may be called to be a nurse. You may be called to be a bookkeeper. You may be called to be a carpenter or a, or a builder. You may be called to be a teacher, a doctor, a lawyer. You may be called to be a, a administrator of a city. You may be called to be an, an assistant an administrative assistant, a, a secretary, a clerk, a salesperson. You may be called to be a farmer. You may be called to be many different things that you can be gifted and chosen by God to be. And I think the highest calling in the universe is to be a Christian mother. I really do. Christian mothers have more influence on the universe probably than anybody else in the universe, any human. Christian mothers have those precious little babies, formative years. Wow. I mean, those little babies are just like sponges. Their, their brains are computers, their emotions. They're just pulling, they're just absorbing and, and, and pulling in information from everywhere. And the Christian mother who knows how to surround that baby with heaven, with Christ, with the things of truth and righteousness, it's the highest calling in the universe. Now I realize that there are times when moms don't do the Christian thing that they wish they had done. And it's, it's always a blessing when God has other moms around that can make up that difference. Grandmoms, aunts. And I praise God for those kind of uh, ladies that are around, that see needs in the precious, formidable, young, impressionable lives of children. And it's real. Very real. Um, and, the, and the world is the world is full of horror stories of how terrible some things have been for some children. But it's also filled of glorious stories about how some Christian women have stepped in and made the difference. And made the rescue. 
And my mind goes back to VBS. We were talking about VBS a while ago. We're going to do VBS. <laughs> wow. And Sunday school. And I, I grew up in the Lutheran church in Sunday school. And, and, the, and the women that God had there at VBS and Sunday school was incredible. It was just fabulous. And, I, and, and if you really are looking for a mission, then, then you could be a missionary right in Sabbath school or right in VBS. And you can do a great work. And, and I know the Bible talks a lot about the great men of faith. But don't you forget those great women of faith. I mean, you, you, don't, get any, you don't get any larger than Queen Esther. I mean, that's as big as it gets. God used her to save her whole, her whole race, the whole Jewish people. He used her, a woman, to save her whole nation. Amen. And then you think of Deborah, who was a judge. God couldn't find the man to do it. He was a little cowardly. And so he raised up Deborah, and she came along and helped the guy get going. And together they made an awesome team. And so God uses women in powerful ways. And, and, I, and I hope you're not sitting there as a lady thinking that all, all the Bible talks about is, are great men of faith. Guarantee you, this man Cornelius had a great woman in his life. You don't become exceptional in life, in your performance, in your skills, in your abilities, unless you grow up with some wonderful woman working with you as a young boy becoming a man. That's real. So don't let the enemy try to tell you that, that this whole thing has become all about men. It's not. It's about man and woman in Christ and the things they can accomplish. So he was a centurion in charge of a hundred crack troops, special troops. But he was a devout man. Even more importantly, he was a devout man, one who feared God, who respected God. And honored God with all of his household, with everything he had, with his family in every aspect, who gave alms. Now, alms is when you have more than you necessarily need, or even you just have a little extra, and you use that to help those who have less. You're a, you're a good, cheerful giver. So he was always helping the poor and the needy. And he prayed to God once in a while. Now this guy, he was already praying without ceasing before the Apostle Paul even wrote that scripture that says we should pray without ceasing. He was, being, he was instructed by the Spirit. He was led by the Spirit. His life was a life of prayer. He prayed all the time, the Bible. He was always praying. Now that's quite a testimony and about the ninth hour of the day, he had a vision. And in a vision, and an angel of God coming in and talking to him. Those are pretty cool experiences, I, I, I assume. Cornelius, he said. And when he observed him, he was afraid and said, what is it, Lord? Now, most of the time in the Bible, when people have an angel come in and talk to them, they, they get scared. It's a, it's a fearful thing because it's so holy and it's so powerful. Now, I've never had a physical angel appear before me and have a conversation with me. I saw some angels one time on some buildings around me. And I know they were holy angels because they were friendly and they were making friendly gestures, but I couldn't see their faces. I, and, and, you know, I only heard a slight voice. I've had one time where I knelt and prayed with two people, and, we, and I started to pray, and I couldn't pray anymore. And I thought it was, as far as I was concerned, it, it, I thought that God had come down in that place in a powerful way to just let us know that he was bigger than we actually thought he was, and to just kind of sober us up a little bit. It could have been an angel. Because a lot of times when, when people have angels, they think it's the Lord. Because it's so holy and so powerful. So now reading this, I realize it could have just been an angel that day. I don't know. But I've never had an angel appear before me like this and call me by name like this. But I would love to have that experience. 
And this is not some guy that just gets scared easily. He's in charge of a hundred serious combat warriors. He's not some little, little wimp. But when you get in the presence of, of, of God, of, of heaven, of holiness, it, it, it is a serious thing. And I don't know what it looked like. This is what one artist thought it might have looked like. So here's what the angel said. I would love for an angel to come and say this to me. So he said to him, Your prayers and your alms have come up for a memorial before God. And he gives him instructions. Send, send, your, send some men to Joppa for Simon, whose surname is Peter. Now this is, God is speaking to us in the 21st century through his first century writer, Luke. Luke, the they believe wrote, and I believe wrote the book of Acts. So prayer moves the hand of God, but that's not all. Alms moves the hand of God. Lending to the poor or giving to the poor, helping the poor moves the hand of God when it's done in the spirit of Christ. I call it agape faith. And I didn't coin that. I'm sure many others have said that. But when your faith is moved because of the love of Jesus Christ, you can never go wrong. Amen. And it's like when I pull up, when I get off the freeway and I come down and it's a red light and there's a guy sitting there and he has a sign that says, uh, veteran, uh, uh, veteran needing help. Man, I've got, I'm getting, if, if it don't, you know, I'm pulling my dollar out. I'm giving him at least a dollar. Now, I'm not bragging on me. That's not much. Give him a $100 bill, now that's something. Or even a 10. Or a 5. But how many people just lock their doors when they pull up to those things? Oh, man, I hope he doesn't grab my door and try to pull me out of my car. You know, <laughs> there's, no, there's no peace in fear. I guarantee you that. <laughs> Or, or, or lately, more and more, because it, it's kind of a rough time. The economy's tough and a lot of people are unemployed. Lately, you go to the grocery store and, and before you get back to your car, you may be, uh, someone may confront you and say, hey, do you have some change to spare so I can catch a bus back to where I've got to go? You know, something like that. And, and you can either say, yeah, yeah, here. Or you can just say, no, no. Or you can just ignore them. And, you know, I think most of us have been in that situation. And I'm pretty sure that all of us who are, at least who are born again Christians, now there's some people who call themselves Christians who haven't yet been born again. And if you don't know what that means, that probably means you haven't been born again. Not necessarily, but it may. But if you're a born again Christian, you know how good it feels when you actually give that person some money. Right? Now I've been through all the head games and the conversations and well if you give them money they just go buy booze or they may go buy crack or they may go do this, cigarettes, whatever, blah, 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 blah. But I had to think through all that just like the rest of us have to think through all that. And here's how I have thought through that. This is where I have, have been. And here's where I am. Well yeah, they may actually have a crack habit, a heroin, cocaine, they may have an alcohol problem, they may have smoke cigarettes, they may do all those things, and yes, that's true, they might go and just buy a bunch of that stuff, but somewhere down the road, they're going to have to buy some food. And so if my dollar helps them get closer to using somebody else's dollar to buy some food, then I'm giving them my dollar, because I'm not in charge of them anyway. I'm not in charge of what they do with my dollar. All I'm in charge is giving him a dollar, or a five dollars, or a ten dollars. That's all I'm in charge of. The Holy Spirit's in charge of who they become Amen. and what they do with it. Amen. I remember back in the day, we used to go down to Tijuana a lot. We had, a, we had one of those Oldsmobile cutlasses that they took a gasoline engine, turned it into a diesel engine, which was the first mistake. But we had a 35 gallon tank in our trunk or a 30 gallon tank and we'd go down to Tijuana we lived there in 
close to San Diego. We'd go down there and we'd fill up for 18 cents a gallon when it was 50 cents a gallon in Carlsbad. And we'd do some shopping. We'd like to go to Tijuana and go around, make deals. Man, I got some good leather coats down there. I'm kind of ashamed at how cheap I got them because I should have actually paid them more, but you know, that was back when I was still a little more greedy than I am now. But I'd always have a pocket full of dollar bills. And you know, I know that the pimp is over there sitting in the shade watching his little workers out there beg for money. And those little workers aren't going to get very much of that money. But you know what? They're not going to get anything if I don't give them something. He's going to give them a percentage. And if I don't give them something, they're not even going to get a little percentage. And I know all that. But I could not because of Jesus in my soul. And this is the only reason, the only reason that I have ever loved anybody is because of Jesus Christ. And because he was real enough in my soul and beautiful enough in me, I could, I could not, and I still cannot, walk by those poor beggars. They look like skeletons because they don't eat very often. And for the life of me, I don't know how anybody can walk by those people and not give them something. Especially if you call Jesus Christ your Lord Amen. and your Savior. And that's, who, that's what this is talking about here. Cornelius, your prayers and your loving people, your pitying people, your helping people, your desire to see people better off than they are has come up before God as a memorial. This is what moves the heart of God. This is what moves the hand of God. Love. Agape faith that works. That actually performs good deeds. And it's not discriminating. Doesn't care if you're red, yellow, black, brown, or pink, or orange. And I've seen some pink and orange people. <laughs> they get that stuff all over them, and you can't tell what color they were originally. But we still need to love them. We still need to help them and, and, and reach out to them. Amen? Amen. Amen. This is so cool. I mean, when an angel comes and tells you something, they know everything that you need to know. Not, not only is his name Simon, his nickname is Peter. His other name's Peter. I want you to know which Simon to look for because he's staying at a guy's house and his name is Simon. You don't want that guy, he's a tanner. Not that a tanner is a bad thing to be, but this other guy's an apostle. And you've got to ask for the right Simon. And this guy, Simon, whose surname is Peter, is going to tell you what you need to do. Now that ought to give you a clue that reading 1st and 2nd Peter is a very important mission to accomplish. If Peter was good enough for God to instruct Cornelius on how to live forever... I'd say 1st and 2nd Peter should be studied very thoroughly. Amen? Amen? So, he even told him his house is by the sea. He's not only a tanner. You get to this village in Caesarea. You don't need, he asks for Simon the tanner who lives by the sea. He will tell you what you must do. And when the angel who spoke to him had departed, Cornelius called two of his household servants and a devout soldier from among those who waited on him continually. Now this guy was living the life. Millionaire, multimillionaire status. But his main ambition in life was finding the author of life. He knew there was more. He wanted more. I want more. Amen. 
Because I, I don't believe that I have everything God has right yet. I mean, I do, by faith, have everything that God has because I have Jesus living in me. But I don't believe I've experienced everything that God wants me to experience. I don't believe that I'm performing at the level that God wants me to perform at. I believe he wants me to perform at a much higher level when I'm talking to people about giving their life to Jesus. I believe there's some fine-tuned things that God wants to do in my life that will cause me to be a greater witness for him. And I believe by coming to church on Sabbath morning, God is able to make adjustments in my life. It's that simple. I believe by getting up and getting on my knees every morning and crying out to God and praying the prayer that Jesus said we should pray every day, I believe, and, and any other prayer you want to pray, I believe that by praying that prayer, simply praying that precious prayer that Jesus risked his whole existence to come here and teach us how to connect with heaven. I believe that praying that prayer every day is giving God a chance to increase his kingdom his wisdom, his faith in me. I believe that when I open my Bible every morning and I read my Bible and I read it by faith, believing that the God who created the universe is going to reveal something to me, he's going to tell me something, he's going to empower me with his holy presence, I, when I do that every morning, something is happening. I'm moving forward and I'm moving upward to the prize of the mark of the high calling that is in Christ Jesus. And that's Philippians 3. I believe that. Because he who comes to God, Hebrews 11 says, he or she who comes to God must believe that he is. See, the guys on the front row got that because you get better grades when you sit in the front row. <laughs> and they're not even on the front row. Here's the front row people over here. These guys are on the second row. He who comes to God must believe that he is, and it doesn't stop there, and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Diligently, fervently, Honorably, consistently, continuously, man, they can't not get enough of Jesus Christ. They are reaching with all they have to reach. They're opening their heart as wide as they can open it. And they're saying, dear God, have mercy on me. Make of me what you will. Order me. And according to your word and by your spirit, it will be done. Amen. That's who Peter was. And he wasn't always that way. He used to be a total jerk, greedy, jealous, selfish. Boasting, braggart. But God brought him to this. Peter came to a place where God sent angels to this man. And he said, call for Peter. He couldn't have done that the night that he was being spit upon. That he was being beaten upon that he was being mocked and ridiculed. Peter denied that he even knew Jesus. He couldn't have sent an angel to tell someone, go find Peter. He'll tell you how to live the life of faith. But now he can. Because something monumental has happened in Peter's life. It's called being born again. It's called being converted. Praise the name of Jesus. So they came. They sent the next day, they went on their journey. 
Peter was up on the housetop. And he got really hungry. He was up there on the house. Here we are, here we are. He went up there to pray. He got alone. I thought I had a handkerchief today, but I left it somewhere. I always cry when I don't have handkerchiefs. That's why I always have handkerchiefs, so I won't cry. Oh, thank you, Carolyn. He went up there to pray. It's good to go somewhere alone. You need to have your alone place. Seriously. And if you don't have that alone place, the Holy Spirit is just hungering and longing and desiring to come and lead you to that alone place. And my thing just shut off. Here we go. Maybe I can get it back up again. These things are driving me to prayer. <laughs> you thought I was going to say something negative, didn't you? I almost did. He went up there to pray and he got hungry. Have you ever gone to pray and you got hungry? And you said, oh, I don't have time to pray. I got to go eat. Or you go up to pray and you get sleepy. Or you go to pray and, oh, man, I got to go play baseball. Or I got to go golf. Or I got to go work in the garden. Or I got to go something. The devil doesn't care what it is. It could be really good stuff. But when you go to pray, you're going to be hit with this hunger stuff. And you're going to be hit with his other distractions and everything in the world going on around you. You're not going to pray as long as you thought you were going to pray when you first went in there to pray. Anybody ever had that happen? It hits us almost every day. And Peter saw heaven opened. And an object like a great sheet bound at four corners descended to him and let it down to the earth. In it were all kinds of four-footed animals of the earth, wild bees, creeping things, and birds of the air. And a voice came to him, Rise, Peter, kill and eat. Man, are you, he was hungry. And now this voice is saying, Go ahead and eat. Now, I, I've been hungry before. And I fall asleep and I'm dreaming. And I dream chocolate cake. <laughs> and I've actually, I've actually dreamed and I can feel my mouth opening in my dream. And I... And I wake up and there's no cake. <laughs> That's what he's experiencing. You know good and well he was hungry. And God was testing him. God was testing him. About eating something that he knew he shouldn't be eating. You know of anybody else who got tested like that? Well, they were in a garden. Garden called Eden. They ate something they shouldn't have been eating. Well, this voice says, rise and kill and eat it. A giraffe? A rattlesnake? An elephant? Are you kidding me? A hippopotamus? But Peter said, no way. I don't eat common, unclean creatures. Good answer. Wow, it sure got quiet in here. You people been eating elephants and giraffes? <laughs> I hope not. They're on the, you can get in trouble for eating those animals. And a voice spoke to him again the second time. What God has cleansed, you must not call common. This was done how many times, Charlie? Where's Charlie? He's out of here somewhere. Three times. It was his, oh, yeah, I know. He had to go do a ministry somewhere else. That's true. So he's on ministry right now. I know that's true. But three times. It's amazing how God used these threes all the time. And the object was taken up into heaven. Now, Peter was trying to figure out what did that vision mean? And while he was thinking and contemplating and trying to figure it out, uh, these men from Cornelius were at the gate. And they called and asked, Brother Simon, whose surname was Peter, was there. And while Peter was trying to figure this vision out, the Spirit said to him, there's three men looking for you. That is totally cool. The thing was let down three times, and there's three men looking for you. Threes are a big deal in the Bible. 
Not that I put a big, uh, I'm not, I'm not a, a palm reader or a crystal ball gazer or those kind of things. But, but God uses numbers. God likes numbers. I, you know, I mean, that can scare some people who don't like math and algebra and stuff, but God likes numbers. He says, go, rise, go, and go with them. Don't doubt anything, for I sent them to you. Then Peter went down, and he saw these men, and he said, yes, I'm he, I'm the one you're looking for. Why have you come? And he tells them about Cornelius the centurion, all about his reputation. He says he was divinely instructed to send for you, to hear words of life from you. He invited them in. They left the next day, and some of the brethren from Joppa went with Peter. Are you kidding me? If I'm living in Joppa, and I'm a believer, and three men are sent by an angel, and they're asking for Simon Peter, and, and Peter has the voice of God telling him, you've got to go, I'm like, hey, Peter, can I come too? Can I come watch? Oh, yeah. Man, when you hear about something going on that God's doing, you want to go watch. You want to get in there and see what, like Zacchaeus, man, he's shinnied up that tree. He's like, I'm not going to miss this. I've heard about Jesus. I want to see what Jesus is really all about. And nobody's going to stop me even if I have to climb a tree and look like a dodo head. He climbed that tree. So these guys are on their way. They got to Caesarea. Cornelius is waiting for them. <laughs> and all of his relatives and close friends, are you kidding me? Cornelius has told them, hey man, an angel called and told me to go get this guy Peter. You want to be here when this guy shows up because something big is about to happen. You can't make God bigger than he is, but you can sure make him bigger than what you've been making him. Did anybody hear that? We can't tell the story big enough. We can never tell the story too big. All of his relatives and friends have heard, man, they're coming back from Joppa, and this is going to be good. You better get here early because the seats are going fast. Someday, whether I'm here or not, that should happen right here in Arlington. There shouldn't even be standing room in here if we get what God wants to give us. Now, if we get just what we've been settling for, it'll just be like this or less. But if we get what God is really wanting to give us, and I believe what he is trying to give us, there won't even be standing room in here. And I've seen that happen. I have seen that happen. And I believe he's able to do it right here, right now. Whether I'm here or not. So we might as well just let him have his way. In our own private lives, in our own personal Bible study, our own personal prayer lives, and how we handle our money. If you're blowing your money on all the garbage this world is producing, you don't have any money to give any alms to anybody. And you better stop it immediately. And if you think I'm chewing you out, you are 100% correct. <laughs> if you're guilty, just own it. If you're not doing that, be thankful that the grace of God has prevailed in your life so that you aren't doing that. But for the grace of God, so go I. But if you're caught up into that debt trap and that buy all I can get trap, I almost messed that up, and, and that build me another house so I can store a bunch more junk in it trap, if you're into that mess, you need to get free and I will come to your house and deliver you in the name of Jesus Christ. If you want it done. I believe that. Biggest bunch of junk hoarders in the history of the world. Americans. It's true. We need delivered from this nonsense. Well, I better keep going or you'll get two sermons today. Actually, three. Nah, yeah, you just be quiet over here. <laughs> so Cornelius is so humble, Peter comes in. This, he's a big shot, this Cornelius. He's a big shot. He's in charge of the crack troops of Rome. 
He's a centurion. He's a multimillionaire. But he's so humble, he falls on his knees. He falls before Peter, worshiping him because he knows that he needs help from above. But Peter lifted him up, saying, Stand up, I myself am also a man. And as he talked with him, he went in and found many who had come together, people who were hungering for Jesus, for heaven. Then he said to them, You know how unlawful it is for a Jewish man to keep company with or go to one of another nation. I shouldn't even be in here with you guys. But God has shown me that I should not call any animal common or unclean. That's not what that vision was about at all. By the time he gets to Caesarea, the Holy Spirit has clearly identified and explained the entire vision. That's the reason he went into Cornelius' house. He says, because God has shown me that I should not call any man common or unclean. Therefore, I came without objection as soon as I was sent for. I asked then, for what reason have you sent for me? Now, this is good. Two more verses, three, three more verses, and then we'll be done. So Cornelius said, four days ago I was fasting. Now, now, now we get the whole story. He wasn't only praying, he was fasting. And God likes fasting. He approves of Christ-centered fasting. When you're fasting for Jesus Christ, when you're fasting for heaven, when you're fasting for the increase of God's kingdom to occur, God's hand will move. In fact, you can't even fast that way unless God's hand has already moved on you. Amen. And we need to be about this. So he wasn't only just praying, he was adding fasting to his prayers. In Mark chapter 9, and I think it's about verse 27, 29, somewhere in there. He, Jesus, the disciples were not able to set this young boy free from demons. And the, dad said, and the disciples finally got along with Jesus. And they said, Jesus, why couldn't we set him free? And Jesus said, this kind can only be dealt with through fasting and prayer. Not just prayer, fasting. We're living in a time where Satan is attacking the human race like never before. And soon, during the time of trouble, it will be like nothing the universe has ever seen. He will be allowed to do things to the human race that he's never been allowed to do. If you don't know how to fight him now, you're going to be in big, big trouble then. Most church-going people don't even know how to face him up. They don't even know how to address him in the footsteps of Jesus Christ. Jesus said, if you believe in me, you'll be able to do the very works I have done. Amen. Amen. John 14, 12. He also said, as the Father sent me, I send you the same way. You better learn how to fight the enemy of God or he will crush you in a heartbeat. Because soon, all the intercession of Christ for the nations of the earth will be removed. And all those who do not have the Holy Spirit living in their lives will follow Satan's delusions and deceptions and, and, and nonsense. They'll think he is Jesus Christ. They'll be swept off their feet, putty in the devil's hands. And if you have not learned how to say, it is written, Satan, get behind me because I belong to Jesus Christ. His blood redeemed me from the curse of sin. If you have not learned how to say, Satan, I am purchased by the blood of Jesus. You cannot have me. I am his property. If you haven't learned how to do it the way Jesus did it, you better learn quickly. You read Matthew 4 and you'll find out. Matthew 4 and you'll find out. Jesus didn't sit around talking about theories, wondering if there were really demons, wondering what demons did, wondering where they lived, wondering la, 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 la. He just went right to the Word, and he said, it is written. That's the only way you deal with Satan. And you guys are putting up with a lot more garbage from Satan than you should be because you don't even think it's him. You haven't even figured that out. 
And we need to be busy about figuring those things out. Amen. Amen. And fasting is a big door into that realm of understanding. So Cornelius, four days ago I was fasting until this hour. And at the ninth hour I prayed in my house. And behold, a man, an angel, stood before me in bright clothing. And he said, Cornelius, your prayer has been heard and your alms are remembered in the sight of God. Send for Peter. He said, so I sent. I sent for you. He goes over the whole thing. I sent for you. And Peter says, in truth I perceive that God shows no favoritism. He has no favorites. There are no pet students in the kingdom of heaven. I ha God has no partiality. What he's done for Moses or Elijah or Esther or Paul or Aquila and Priscilla or Timothy, what he's done for any of these people, he will do for you. Because they are no more favored than you are. He shows no favoritism. What he's done for one, he will do for all. That's what this is saying here. My God is an equal opportunity employer. And he will definitely pay you more than it's worth. More than anything. You could never do anything that could earn what God is going to pay you. He will always pay more than we could ever earn. Peter's preaching to them. And he says, I'm learning things. I'm learning that in every nation, this is big. This is broken out of Israel. It's broken out of Jerusalem. This is huge. More than anything, and anybody can, whoever fears and whoever does the righteousness of Christ is received by God. And he's explaining everything about the baptism of John. He's giving him a real Bible study. Talks about how Jesus was anointed. He says, and we're witnesses of all this. We saw Jesus do all these things. And we saw them kill Jesus by hanging him on a tree. We saw all these things. We know that God raised him on the third day. And the, and the chosen witnesses who ate and drank with him, we saw him after he rose from the dead. And I've seen Jesus. I've seen Jesus in, in godly people. I've seen Jesus in songs that I've heard people sing. I've seen Jesus in that, in that saxophone and, and, and the singing of Raul and Damaris. I've seen Jesus in people. I've seen Jesus in the way people treat me. I praise God for the Christians who cared enough to touch my life when I was living in hell. And you don't even know what hell is if you haven't been where I was when I was a little boy and when I was a teenager. And I know the Christians that God sent to me Most of them are dead now. But I will be looking for them when I get to heaven. All the prophets witness to this Jesus. And you can receive re remission of your sins. The Holy Spirit fell upon them. Even though they weren't even circumcised. He heard them speak with tongues, languages that they had never spoken, supernatural manifestations of the Holy Spirit. I have personally seen this in my own life. I have seen this happen, and it was real language. It wasn't jibber-jabber. It was real language. And I've seen people saved because of this firsthand I've heard about it happening to other pastors, but I've seen it myself firsthand. It's real. He said, since this has happened, 
How can I forbid water that they should be baptized? Immediately, he baptized them. He did not wait till they were keeping the Sabbath up to the standards that he believed they should be keeping it. He didn't even ask them if they were keeping the Sabbath because they already were to the best of their ability. As soon as a person puts their trust in Jesus Christ and says, I want Jesus to save me from my sin. I want him to take everything out of my life that the Bible calls sin. As soon as you say, yes, Jesus, save me from anything that you call sin, you need to get baptized right away. Don't let people tell you that you have to wait until you're good enough, until you know enough, until this or that. As long as you're ready to give everything in your life to Jesus Christ and let him take charge of you as your Lord, you are qualified to be baptized that same hour. You see this over and over and over again in the book of Acts. Amen. And this is not the Acts of the Apostles. This is the Acts of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is not about to baptize them with himself. He baptized them with the Holy Spirit Evidence they were speaking in languages that they'd never learned before. Peter said, since God baptized them, who am I to say they can't be baptized? If, you know what the greatest evidence that the Holy Spirit has, has moved into residency in a person's life? You know what the greatest evidence is? is that they're calling on Jesus to cleanse them of their sins. I don't have to wait till somebody talks in tongues to know that they've received the Holy Spirit. Now, there's some people that teach that, but I don't teach that. All I have to see is, are they really turning their lives, their sinful lives, over to Jesus Christ? Are they, are they ready to allow Him to remove anything that the Bible classifies, defines, or establishes as sin? As soon as they're ready to do that, man, we're going to the water. And if you're, if, you, if you're doing that and you haven't been baptized, you need to be baptized. Well, I can't. It takes four hours to fill the tank, so I can't do it today. But if you go with me up to Gregory Lake, I'll baptize you at Lake Gregory today. And I know he went longer than I planned. And I do not apologize. Because you are Americans, or at least you live in America, and you are free to come and go. I did not hold you here against your will. So if you're mad because I preached too long, just get mad at yourself because you didn't leave. <laughs> I want more of Jesus than I've ever had before. And not just for me. I want more of Jesus for my sweet wife, for my dear wife. Amen. And for my dear children. And for my brothers and sisters in Christ. If I can do more for Christ, that means I can, I can help you more. You know what else it means? If I get more of Jesus, you can actually help me more. It takes a lot of Jesus to let somebody help you. You know, I can do that. You don't need your help. But you get more of Jesus, oh, hey, I need all the help I can get. What can you help me with? It, it causes us all to be humble and more workable and teachable. And I'll invent a new word, helpable. So where are you at? How's your prayer life? You want to see God's hand move? Well, you need to walk where Cornelius walked. He didn't even know who Jesus was. But he knew there had to be some kind of an awesome God up there and he believed in him and he wanted more of him. Is that where you are? Well, God's good with that. That's awesome. He'll teach you how to pray. He'll lead you into the prayer life of Cornelius. And then he'll teach you how to be more, more liberal with your money. And maybe you need to be more careful with your money so that you can have money to give. You know, or more sober or, or more intentional about what you're doing in life. 
But he'll lead you to be able to be more than we could ever imagine. He'll lead you to where you can help people more. He'll lead you to be able to fast like Cornelia fasted. And who knows? He may send an angel to tell you something. And that would be awesome. Wouldn't that be awesome? So if you're here today, if you came here today, you came here and you know for sure that your life does not belong to Jesus Christ. You know for sure that you're in charge of your own life and you sin when you want to sin and you, you, you obey when you want to obey and you just take care of everything you want to take care of, but you're sick and tired. You're done with that. You know that's not going to work. And you're saying, man, I came in without Jesus, but I don't want to leave without him. Then, then I beg you to just say, yes, Jesus. Just say, yes, Jesus. He knows what that means. He will come in and give you the greatest life than you could ever think of. And that's how simple I want to make it, because I want the doors of the church wide open. I, you know, I don't want you to have to come up here to become a Christian. Now, if you want to come up here, I'm all for that. I like that. I will, I will pray with you. I'll cry with you. I'll laugh with you. I'll do all that. But if, I, but if for whatever reason... You don't think that's the right way to do it? Then I'm just begging you, wherever you're at, with, you don't even have to close your eyes. You don't even have to kneel so that people might think you're becoming a Christian. All you have to do is say, yes, Jesus. And he will, he will, take, he will take you on the ride of your life. And then someday in heaven, I want to hear about it. Because I got an idea that pretty soon we're not going to have time to sit around talking and telling stories to each other. We're going to be so busy telling stories to the people who've never met Jesus. We won't have time to even tell stuff to each other. At least that's the kind of revival I'm praying for. We're going to have Damaris and Raul play and sing one more song. And if you leave before they play, shame on you. No. If you have to go, if you're taking diabetes in, uh, medicine or uh, taking care of a sick person, then don't feel bad about leaving. But man, if there's not a serious reason to leave, you need to stay and receive this blessing that God is pouring out.